The pandemic has severely exacerbated a mental health and addiction crisis that predated COVID-19. Nearly 107,000 Americans died of overdoses in the past 12 months, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association have declared a national children's mental health emergency. Access to treatment has never been more important, yet coverage for that treatment remains inadequate, with far too many barriers being placed between patients and life-saving care. Today, we'll discuss what the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is doing to advance mental health and addiction parity and to get more people the help they need. Let's get started by meeting our panelists. First, we're thrilled to have Javier Becerra, the 25th Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and the first Latino to hold the office in the history of the United States. As Secretary, he is carrying out President Biden's vision to ensure all Americans have health security and access to health care. He's previously served as the Attorney General of the State of California. We also welcome Dr. Miriam Delphin Bittman, Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use at the Department of Health and Human Services. She is the Administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA. Next, we're excited to have Dr. Patrice Harris, a board certified psychiatrist who has diverse experiences as a private practicing physician, public health director, and patient advocate. In 2019, Dr. Harris was elected the 174th president of the American Medical Association. We also welcome Sean Coughlin, who is president and CEO of the National Association for Behavioral Health Care and who serves as the association's principal lobbyist. And finally, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy was lead author of the 2008 Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act and is founder of the Kennedy Forum. So let's get started with today's panel. Uh, Secretary Becerra, uh, I'd like to start with you. Uh, many people forget um, that mental health and addiction parity is not only about employer-sponsored plans that are primarily regulated by the Department of Labor. Uh, indeed, HHS oversees parity for about 60 million Americans in the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, and for Medicaid managed care, where nearly half of the enrollees are children. HHS is also responsible for ensuring equal coverage rights for the 14.5 million Americans in individual marketplace plans and for millions of state and local public employees and their family members. The plans that HHS oversees uh, disproportionately provide coverage for Blacks and Latinos, as well as low and middle income Americans. Uh, earlier this year, the department uh, released a report with the Departments of Labor and Treasury that really demonstrated how seriously the administration is taking parity enforcement. Can you talk about why parity is so critical to addressing our nation's mental health and addiction crisis and why the department is prioritizing strong enforcement of the Federal Parity Act? Sure, David, thank you very much. And it's a thrill to be with so many of you and to see my, my buddy and former colleague in Congress, uh, Patrick Kennedy here. And uh, thanks to everyone for the work they're doing and to our Assistant Secretary, Miriam Delvin Rittman for everything she and folks at SAMHSA are doing. This is critical because how can you talk about getting past COVID? How can you talk about closing the gaps we found through the pandemic on public health? How can you talk about really seriously treating health in a holistic way if you don't have parity when it comes to a physical versus a mental challenge that someone might face? Uh, I say that as someone who began his career in, in, the, in the law, representing folks uh, who were mentally challenged uh, in the state of Massachusetts. And uh, I, I know that for so many families, just being able to access the care they need is not even in the cards. And so here we go with the federal government under President Biden making this real big reach to do far better for Americans. And we've done some great stuff so far uh, with the Affordable Care Act, uh, enrollments of more Americans than ever before, uh, expanding care under Medicaid, uh, making sure everyone has access to vaccines without having to pay a cent, but we have a lot of work to do on behavioral health. And so for the president, he made it very clear in the State of the Union, this is not just a goal, it's a mission. And so here at HHS, we take it very seriously. And we know if we do it right, people will be able to not only have their rights enforced, but they'll have a much better life moving forward. So David, this is a priority for HHS because it's a priority for Americans and certainly for the American in the White House named Joe Biden. 
No, that, that's terrific. And we're, we're deeply grateful for the administration's you know, priority of uh, prioritization of mental health uh, and addiction parity. So I'd now like to turn to the assistant secretary, uh, Dr. Delphine Whitman. Uh, the recent report highlighting parity compliance issues uh, is not the only action that HHS is, is taking. Um, I understand you have some important news to announce regarding how the department and the along with the departments of labor and treasury, um, you know, are working with state partners to educate and inform consumers, families, and even state regulators uh, to advance full implementation of parity. Can you tell us about what is being released? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 thank you, David, and and thank you to the Kennedy Forum and and Patrick just for the invitation to be here. Um, we are so pleased to be able to share. Uh, the release of additional parity tools that uh, we've been working on. Uh, I do have to say this has been a collaboration with Department of Labor, uh, Centers for Medicaid and uh, Medicare Services, Department of Treasury, uh, and a true collaboration ultimately to advance parity. Um, so there's three products that we're releasing, and uh, the first uh, is titled Essential Aspects of Parity, uh, a training tool for policymakers. Uh, and this tool essentially provides a technical overview of mental health and substance use disorder parity uh, and how to implement and comply with federal parity laws uh, regarding employee sponsored health plans uh, and group and individual health insurance. Uh, it contains a, a broad range of information and just a few examples, uh, for instance, uh, information about the importance of compliance activities, uh, interaction with state law benefits of, and classifications as well as sub classifications uh, and then requirements for medical necessity criteria. Uh, a second publication is titled Understanding Parity, a guide uh, for uh, resources for families and caretakers. Uh, and essentially this guide provides an overview of parity geared towards parents, family members and caregivers. Uh, with information and tools uh, to help them obtain behavioral health services for children or family members in their care. Um, we believe that this one is particularly timely, given that we know children and young people have really struggled through the pandemic. Uh, and so therefore connecting them to services and supports uh, facilitated by parity compliance. Uh, you know, parity compliance is critical here. Uh, and this essentially can help to uh, prevent behavioral health conditions from getting worse uh, to the extent that young people are connected to services. Um, so this booklet includes information about, for example, how to access care and what to pay, uh, to know and when to know if parity applies to an insurance plan, uh, or what to do, for example, if a claim is denied uh, and options around how to appeal it. Um, so we're excited about that resource. Um, and then a final publication I want to share information about is titled Know Your Rights. Uh, and this essentially is an updated trifold pamphlet uh, explaining parity law, um, what it means to the consumer, and listing protections it provides. Uh, SAMHSA, along with our federal partners, we released this previously, but the current version has updated uh, information uh, and essentially reflects the changing parity landscape. Um, so we're pleased to be able to release these resources. Uh, we think they'll, they'll be uh, valuable and, and really helpful to uh, folks looking for uh, parity information and parity resources. So thank you. That, that's terrific, uh, Dr. Delphine Whitman. And these resources you know, certainly, I think, will help realize uh, the promise of parity and advance the cause. Um, so Dr. Harris, uh, I'd like to turn to you on what parity you know, means for children and families. Uh, based on your experience as a child psychiatrist, um, how does the lack of parity in our health insurance system impact children across America, um, but especially in Black and other you know, marginalized communities? First of all, let me uh, state what an honor and a privilege it is to be on this panel with my uh, esteemed co-panelists, and thank you to the Kennedy Forum for elevating this issue. Certainly, um, I wish we didn't have to have this forum because as you noted in the opening remarks, parity has been on the books since 2008. You know, I completed my residency training at Emory in 1998, and I remember being frustrated with and uh, my patients being frustrated with the fact that I would tell them I only had six visits over the course year to work with them. That was all that was approved or talking to my patients um, who had Medicare 
and seeing their frustration when they realized they had higher out-of-pocket expenses uh, to come to me as a psychiatrist for their behavioral health care. Um, and that was quite, of course, different from their medical and surgical care. So that was in 1998. And unfortunately, 10 years later, um, we did have the laws on the books. But I have to say, David, we're still having issues of folks not getting uh, the same level of care that they are getting and benefits for their uh, psychiatric uh, disorders. And that should not be the case. We know uh, that by not getting the care they need, they are not getting the adequate treatment that they need. Um, their symptoms remain um, more severe for longer periods of time. And so that is just unacceptable. And certainly the pandemic has elevated issues around health inequities. And so these disparities in coverage just make those inequities worse. And finally, I will say, you know, I had the privilege of chairing the AMA's opioid task force uh, from 2014 to 2011. And we saw so many issues where coverage for substance use disorders was not on par. So we have to elevate this issue. And we know then that they live sicker and die younger, don't get the care uh, that they need. So we must elevate this issue. And I'll say one last thing, and I was uh, glad to see uh, Dr. Delph and Rittman talk about the resources. Because when talking to insurance commissioners uh, for years, they would say, we're not hearing about it. And I think most patients uh, didn't know about it. So those resources are going to be very helpful. No, absolutely. I agree. And um, certainly, I think the equity component uh, points to why HHS's you know, work is so important, um, particularly in Medicaid uh, managed care um, you know, with parity. So, Sean, uh, you know, we've touched briefly on why you know, parity matters uh, for uh, individuals and their families, but it, of course, also impacts providers uh, trying to provide uh, needed care, um, providers your organization represents. Um, so, two of the longstanding you know, federal policies that you know, really are incompatible with concepts of parity um, are, first, the Medicaid Institutions for Mental Disease, or the IMD exclusion, you know, which prohibits Medicaid from reimbursing uh, mental health facilities with more than 16 beds, as well as Medicare's 190-day lifetime limit on inpatient psychiatric care. Um, additionally, Medicare uh, does not cover you know, key intermediate levels of mental health and addiction care. Can you just describe kind of the impact of these policies uh, that you've seen uh, through your members? Sure. Thanks, David. And let me also thank everybody for uh, the ability to participate on this forum today. Patrick has been tireless in his efforts on parity, and and uh, it's so great to see Secretary Becerra and Madam Secretary Delphin Rittman uh, joining his fight again and, and bringing more resources to bear. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do moving forward, but I'm positive we can make some very serious positive changes in the near term here. Um, the Medicare, uh, the Medicaid IMD exclusion and the Medicare 190 day lifetime limit, frankly, have contributed to dramatic reductions in the availability of inpatient acute care for people with serious mental illness and substance use disorders. Um, as a result, they've also reduced access to step down care that's available for individuals once their acute care has been completed. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that no. Are, there are no other hard limits like this on inpatient care for medical conditions. So to David's point, this really does not address the issue of parity. Um, and further, these limits are quite frankly, not based on science or clinical expert consensus. Um, in fact, both the, the, the leading professional clinical associations for healthcare and addiction treatment recognize that inpatient treatment is a crucial level of care for individuals with both serious mental illness and substance use disorders. Um, unfortunately, since the 70s, we have seen a number of inpatient and residential uh, treatment beds uh, decrease dramatically by at least 64%. And this has resulted in really tragic outcomes for millions of individuals who are living with serious mental illness and, and SUD. Um, and we're seeing it particularly in high rates of incarceration. Uh, there are millions of individuals who have been booked into jail every year uh, for many for just really minor crimes um, and they end up staying in jail longer and they are often are not receiving the treatment that they need on uh, behavioral health treatment that they need. So, um, and the other result that we're seeing obviously is the increased reliance on emergency rooms to care for individuals. And frankly, these ERs are not well suited to address 
uh, behavioral health patient needs. So um, <clears throat> also point out that since uh, the, the latest data we had in 2018 shows that the most common type of SUD treatment that Medicaid beneficiaries received was actually emergency care, which again is not the, the most appropriate use uh, uh, place for treatment. Um, and finally, obviously the COVID pandemic as, as mentioned has further exacerbated this problem and reduce the supply of psychiatric beds as, as beds and units were actually converted under many of the waivers that were allowed uh, by CMS to uh, treat COVID patients. So um, all of this has happened at a time where we're seeing an increased need for our services um, and increased wait times for individuals who um, do present at the emergency room, uh, trying to get them into a specialized inpatient or other treatment setting. And I'm sure we've all heard the stories of, of people who are being boarded in ERs, particularly children, sadly, who are being boarded in ERs waiting for weeks, if not longer, for a bed to become available. So uh, very real negative impacts of those those two policy proposals, policy initiatives, excuse me. Now, thank you, Sean, for elaborating on this. Um, you know, I think, thankfully, for each of these areas, there are efforts under, underway to address them. Um, so, Secretary Becerra, I'd like to turn back to you. Um, President Biden has shown great leadership in calling for parity in all types of health plans, including traditional Medicaid and Medicare. Um, but you know, Medicare in particular has had insufficient mental health and addiction coverage with core parts of the continuum, um, you know, as, as Sean touched on, you know, simply not covered um, and many types of providers shut out of the program. Why is closing the coverage gaps and applying parity uh, you know, to Medicare so important? David, uh, the pandemic answered that question in case anyone had any doubts. If you don't give people true access, not only do they fall through the cracks, but as we've seen with COVID, they die. And we know there are scores and scores of families across America who right now are in, in true pain. Even as we begin to recover from COVID, there are families who are suffering mightily from the effects of not having had an opportunity to be around family, uh, losing their job, of the stress of trying to cope, and it's really piling up. And so when you don't give them access to the kind of care they need, um, you know, we, we, would, we would not hesitate to let someone come into a hospital if they happen to be stressed and fell over and broke their arm, they'd get that care for that arm. But why is it if they're stressed and they fall over and they show that they're right now mentally challenged uh, with so much upon them that they don't get the same access to the same level of care? And so we're going to do everything we can. Certainly in the Medicaid space, we're trying to do more by providing more parity. But Medicare does present, as you mentioned, some real challenges that only Congress can help us address. But I will tell you this, to the degree that we can do what we are able to with the authorities we have, the president has made it clear that he wants us to, and he just doesn't say it. He shows it in his budget. Budgets are values. And this president has put true meaning behind trying to get to the point of providing equity and parity when it comes to mental health. So we're going to continue to do what we can, but we hope Congress will be there to lend a hand to give us more authorities to make it real, to be able to enforce that parity law and make it uh, the law of the land, not just in the private sector, but also within our public health programs like Medicare and Medicaid. No, absolutely. And uh, you know, certainly I think the president has put this um, firmly on the agenda and now it's up to Congress. Uh, you know, to act and and give you the tools that uh, that you need to um, expand parity to Medicare and you know all of Medicaid. Uh, so thank you. Um, I, I should also mention that um, you know many people uh, think of Medicare as a program for you know only older adults, but it also does you know cover um, you know nine million younger adults um, with disabilities, a large percentage of whom qualify um, due to mental health disorders. So, Congressman Kennedy, uh, I'd like to turn to you. Um, the Federal Parity Act uh, was designed to be a medical civil rights bill um, and is also critical uh, to addressing the ongoing mental health and addiction crisis. Uh, President Biden has said that, uh, has, has called for uh, expanding the Parity Act's protection to tens of millions more Americans. Uh, but as you previously mentioned, uh, we've yet to achieve uh, President Kennedy's vision for community mental health. Can you speak more about that and the concept of a new frontier for parity? Well, thank you, David, for all your good work. And uh, I first wanna thank Secretary Becerra. So good to see you again. It was such an honor to serve with you in Congress and 
to have you as Secretary of Health and Human Services and taking the lead on this. And uh, Secretary Delphine Rittman, thank you for these uh, needed tools to states. You know, when we pass the law to Secretary to Dr. Harris's point, um, we have been delinquent in enforcing those laws. And in part, that's because of the illiteracy around what it means to enforce these laws. How do you do it? And these toolkits that you're releasing um, to state decision makers are going to go a long way to helping us implement and enforce the parity law, which, in it, in, as we've just been speaking about, helps us help more Americans realize the benefit of these services. Um, and, and they need all the power that they can get. They have been too long the victims of a double standard of care where payers pay less, uh, pay less attention, um, give less uh, respect at, to these illnesses. And we are uh, reaping the winds of what we've sown in terms of our discriminatory practices in the past towards uh, treating mental illness, um, going upstream and preventing mental illness and addiction. And so uh, this parity law is, is such a powerful, as you mentioned, David, opportunity to end this separate and unequal treatment, this separate and unequal treatment uh, for the brain as opposed to any other organ of the body. And uh, Secretary Becerra, when you and I were in the House passing this law, it was passed with bipartisan support. It was um, signed into law by a Republican president. Um, other Republican administrations, even the last one, um, especially with uh, uh, former Governor Christie, a big advocate. Um, and we had a number of other as former Secretary of Labor um, on the Republican side said, what is the power of a law if you don't enforce it? And so I just want to say this is a truly unity agenda issue to President Biden's credit. I really appreciate the fact that he's highlighted this. And, and David, to your question, um, we have to move forward in defining parity in broader ways, because we know mental health, and for those of us like myself who are in recovery, the medical piece is just one piece of recovery. We need to include social determinants of health, access to housing, access to supportive living services, none of which, by the way, are measured in the parity law, but which, if we are truly advocates for this cause, we need support to differentiate payers to show those payers who are making a good faith effort towards investing in those things that we know can produce better outcomes. That doesn't let them off the hook for meeting their obligations under parity. But we know going forward that we need a much bigger vision about how do we measure a, a, an effort to try to wrap our arms around the challenges that people have with mental illness and addiction. Well, thank you, Congressman Kennedy. Um, definitely the, the concept of parity you know, extends far beyond the rules of the, the Federal Parity Act. Um, so, Dr. Harris, um, an issue very much relating to parity, um, but also an important issue on its own right, uh, is how plans make medical necessity determinations. Um, one of the longstanding issues with mental health insurance coverage has been that even if a health plan you know, offers or you know, has mental health as a covered benefit, um, when patients actually secure treatment recommendations from a provider, it's often deemed, you know, quote unquote, not medically necessary, um, which forces people to go without care or to incur huge out-of-pocket uh, expenses. Um, the American Medical Association has been uh, very outspoken on the importance of basing medical necessity determinations on generally accepted standards of care uh, and criteria from nonprofit clinical specialty associations. Can you talk about why this is such a serious issue? Dr. Harris, I think you might be on mute. Thank you. Yes, absolutely, because the determinations that are not consistent with generally accepted practice and not 
uh, consistent across payers just puts up another barrier, as you know, just another uh, opportunity to deny people the care that they need. And so it's really critical that we have these conversations. And listen, there, there's a role for regulators and professional societies and payers to jointly uh, decide and have discussions about, but they should be based, these criteria about what is medically necessary should be based again on generally accepted standards of care, what a prudent physician would decide. They should be transparent to tell you sometimes when I have been subject to denials based on uh, these criteria, um, I had no idea what the criteria were. It was not clear, it was not transparent so that I could even answer the question or, or complete the form. Again, forms again, another uh, delay in care. So there's no question that we need to um, elevate this issue. Uh, there needs to be transparency um, and uh, it needs to be transparent across payers. And we really need to make sure that again, uh, these criteria are uh, developed and based on the clinical standards of care and not uh, financial uh, incentives to save dollars. No, absolutely. Um, and we're so appreciative of your leadership uh, on this issue at the AMA, um, including relating to a very important court case uh, that we'll now turn back to uh, Congressman Kennedy on. Uh, Congressman, you've called a federal class action lawsuit, uh, WIT versus United Behavioral Health, a landmark mental health and addiction uh, coverage case. And in this uh, case, uh, a federal district court ruled that United Healthcare had created uh, deeply flawed medical necessity criteria that were inconsistent with generally accepted standards of care and denied mental health and addiction uh, coverage to more than 50,000 uh, class members. Um, tragically, a, th a three judge panel of the federal uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals recently reversed uh, this ruling and held that health insurers are under no obligation uh, to follow generally accepted standards of care. Um, can you explain the significance of this ruling and where should we should go from here? Thanks, David. Um, well, the Witt case um, was really a exhibit A, if you were to talk in legal terms, of the the old practices of payers and really the continuing practice of many payers, if parity is not going to continue to be enforced and if we're not able to overturn this recent appeals, which throws out the lower co court's ruling that uh, no insurance company ought to be using quote unquote proprietary medical decision-making criteria. They ought to be using generally accepted medical standards of care in order to make these necessity determinations, which, as you know, determines whether a loved one gets care and determines how long that care is for. So these are very not esoteric issues. They are very personal issues because they impact the real lives of people seeking to get care. So this court uh, overturning the, the original ruling, which, by the way, the original judge, federal court judge Spiro, said that what United had done was egregious. And the, the words that this uh, trial judge uh, gave to what he saw with United's putting their own medical management criteria for proprietary and personal profit gain for the company, um, which posts some of the biggest uh, profits of any company in the country, at the expense of patient care is just an example of what we're trying to overcome by enforcing this parity law. And we need everybody who is listening to this to help us push back on this appeal and join in an appeal that is en blanc, which means the whole Ninth Circuit is going to have to review this case because the standard that would be set if this were allowed to continue would be that there is no plan in this country that wouldn't be able to use uh, uh, other than medically, um, generally medical standards of care to determine care for someone's loved one, which should scare everyone. And, and it wouldn't be so scary, but for the fact that we have seen so many people denied care for so long because of these insurance practices, that if we don't stand up for this, 
how are we ever going to change um, the way we cover people, as the secretary said, so that we cover whole health um, in a way that's best for the patient and best for our country with proper wraparound services. So this WIT appeal is very important. I hope people continue to uh, stay in touch with the Kennedy Forum's efforts. Um, we have been working with a number of state uh, attorneys general who feel very uh, felt that this overturning of the WIT decision violates their own state laws. In my state of Rhode Island and in many states, we passed laws that said in the wake of the WIT decision, you cannot violate what uh, ASAM, American S Society for Addiction Medicine, locus standards generally say are the best ways to determine uh, care. Um, because otherwise the pressure on the profit motive will be to deny care. And that's why this fight is so important. We cannot have these um, artificial denials of care because an insurance company is looking at their uh, bottom line as opposed to the health and those that they're uh, covered and trying to ensure get the care they need. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a very important case, and we'll certainly be continuing to watch it, uh, watch it closely. Um, Secretary Becerra, I want to turn to you. Throughout your career, uh, you've championed uh, mental health parity. Uh, you voted while in Congress uh, to pass the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act back in 2008, as Patrick as Congressman Kennedy mentioned, um, and as Attorney General in California, you, know, you requested you know, detailed parity compliance information um, from health plans, including information on the criteria they use. Um, just recently in his proposed budget, President Biden called uh, for requiring plans to use criteria consistent uh, with those developed by nonprofit medical associations, um, and also limiting considerations of profit uh, in determining, you know, whether requested care is medically necessary. Um, can you briefly talk about why the administration has called for strengthening rules on how plans make medical necessity determinations? You, you I, was, I want to make sure I was unmuted. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, David. Uh, probably the best way to put this is I think the president recognizes, certainly I recognized as a former attorney general, now the secretary of HHS, that you can have a law in the books, but if you don't give it vitality, you don't give it teeth, then it's hard to really believe you're going to put in action your words on a, in a statute. And so it is important, and this administration is uh, reflecting that, that we must have real transparency. You have to be able to look behind the curtain to see what's going on. You know, as they say, shun, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And man, do we need some disinfectant around in some of these places to make sure we know what's going on. To have compliance, you need to have accountability. Folks have to know that they're gonna be held uh, to the mat to do what they're supposed to do. And finally, to, to hold people to account, you have to have enforcement capability. And I could tell you right now at HHS, we intend to do our part in enforcing the law and making sure there's compliance because it's time and the president has made it very clear. So yes, uh, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. This is you know, yet another area where the administration has been leading on access to mental health services and on, on parity, so, so thank you. Um, Sean, let's uh, turn to you uh, to talk about something that is critical to providers, and that's reimbursement, um, a longstanding area of discrimination. Um, Milliman, in conducting, uh, I think, two reports that they released in recent years, you know, found that behavioral health providers are reimbursed about 20% less for the same codes than physical health providers. Um, and the Federal Parity Act uh, applies to reimbursement rates, but we've seen uh, little progress. Um, thankfully, though, the, the Biden administration um, says it plans to issue regulations on standards for parity uh, in reimbursement rates. Um, what effects uh, have low reimbursement rates you know, had on your members and their ability uh, to provide care and meet the, the needs of their patients? Thanks, David. Um, obviously, low reimbursement rates contribute to workforce shortages, and I know everyone has heard about the exacerbation we've had with these workforce shortage issues with the COVID pandemic. 
Um, we, quite frankly, are in the same pool, uh, working for the same clinicians and, and the same providers that medical surgical providers are, are working for, yet we are at a significant disadvantage uh, because of our lower reimbursement rates. So, it, obviously, it makes it harder for our members to hire and to uh, retain staff. Um, and in fact, the, the shortages in the behavioral space have been so severe that I, I'm sure folks are probably aware of some of the really extreme measures that several states have taken. For example, Oregon recently had to request that the National Guard come in to assist with staffing their mental health facilities. And recently, Virginia as well um, had to stop admitting new patients to its five state mental hospitals due to staff the staffing crisis. So. Um, this is a big problem. It's a, it's particularly problematic with managed care plans. Uh, for example, we know that Medicare Advantage plans typically offer rates and fee schedules that are at or below traditional Medicare pricing. Again, there are plenty of studies out there that show that. Um, unfortunately, in many instances, Medicaid rates are even lower. Um, we're concerned there are there's limited or no oversight or accountability for accurate and timely claims payment by Medicare and Medicaid managed care plans. Um, and we're seeing as a result providers who are struggling, um, we're seeing increasing closures in rural areas and other providers who are struggling to remain open. Uh, we all know that Medicare generally sets the standard. Um, and it's our hope and, and appreciate the Biden administration's work on this front. Uh, to ensure that Medicare rates are at least on par with the medical surgical rates uh, for comparable services. Um, we do, frankly, as an association, believe that this does not necessarily have to be based on parity law alone. Um, CMS does have the responsibility to ensure that access to covered benefits um, you know, are available. And since behavioral health conditions are highly prevalent among Medicare beneficiaries, we think there hopefully is some some regulatory flexibility around there. Um, the secretary also spoke about the, the new disclosure requirements um, to require plans that are participating in Medicare, Medicaid, and the ACA marketplaces to demonstrate that their reimbursement rates for mental health and addiction treatment are on par uh, with comparable medical therapies. So, um, but there's also the issue, uh, we talk about parity and benefits, we talk about parity and reimbursement. We also need to talk about parity and access. Um, and, it, you know, we have to look at the uh, network adequacy requirements uh, that are out there right now. And I know, again, the administration has put out RFIs looking at this specifically. Um, and we believe that there should be standards for all critical levels of care that have been defined, as Patrick mentioned, by ASAM and LOCUS and, and other uh, clinician groups that have really defined the generally accepted standards of care. Um, but that we should have more. Uh, adequacy, uh, network adequacy requirements for all critical levels of care with separate standards for addiction and mental health uh, providers, child and adolescent providers, because the services provided in those different levels are very different. Um, and you cannot just say, oh, we've got a single network that we can send both youth and adolescents to, as well as geriatrics. They have different needs, they have different requirements. And we need to ensure that those networks that the plans are developing actually do include providers who are skilled and experienced in all those various levels of care. It's not a one size fits all kind of network that says once we have one, we can send any age uh, patient to that. Um, to that, and we also are very pleased with the parity compliance um, documentation that the administration has has recently brought on board. That unfortunately found that. Uh, none of the plans were actually in compliance with the documentation requirements. So uh, very disappointing to say the least. We'd, we'd like to see those extended to Medicare and Medicaid advantage. Um, yeah, we know that they're already applied to the ACA marketplace plans, and, and we know those problems continue to exist there. So uh, uh, additional efforts in those areas would be helpful as well. No, well, well, thank you, Sean. I, I think that's a really good point on you know, network adequacy standards and yet another area um, where President Biden and the administration have been leading and calling for really strong you know, network adequacy protections. I think most Americans don't actually realize that for many types of plans, there are essentially no network, network adequacy uh, requirements uh, you know, for many types of particularly employer-based plans. So Congressman Kennedy, um, you know, everyone deserves parity protections, uh, but those with jobs who put them on the front lines 
are more likely to experience uh, trauma and stress. Um, unfortunately, though, members of our armed, for, armed services um, do not have full parity protections in TRICARE, which the Obama administration has indicated is an issue that they would like to see fixed. And TRICARE you know, copies, essentially, many of Medicare's coverage gaps. Um, meanwhile, members of the National Guard and Reserve um, are often insured by individual and employer-sponsored plans in which parity uh, is still not uh, fully a reality. Uh, and then finally, uh, hundreds of thousands of frontline workers and other public employees are denied uh, parity protections by the one half of 1% of self-funded state and local government plans that have chosen to opt out of the Federal Parity Act. Um, something that I should mention that no uh, private employer is allowed to do. Um, so thankfully, you know, President Biden has called for parity in all these plans and also for ending the state and local government uh, plan opt out. So with all this momentum, um, what should advocates do to help make sure that these needed changes are enacted um, so that all Americans are protected uh, by parity? Well, it's uh, really unconscionable that, that our men and women in uniform who over half the service force are guard and reservists, um, that they come back to their civilian jobs and they have to rely on their employer's compliance with parity in order to make sure that their signature wounds of war, of post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury get treated on a par with their other medical needs. I, I really feel like we wouldn't be having this debate if uh, Fortune 500 companies, all companies, frankly, knew that who was in their employment who were guard and reservists who were veterans of our country's um, recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, it would be unconscionable for any of those businesses not to make sure that those employees who are our heroes are getting access to the care that they need um, because of their service on our behalf. And so I, I really think part of our effort is, is getting more people to come forward in general and working with our friends in the uh, veteran community to make sure that they are part of this because really they have a moral authority that is unsurpassed. And if our veteran community says to these major employers, you're not doing enough to verify that we have a, a health plan that protects our members who are working for these big companies, I think that could change this whole dynamic overnight because I don't think there's a company out there in America that wants to run the risk of liability on the moral hazard of denying being part, not enforcing parity and seeing their employees who are our nation's heroes denied mental health and addiction care because of their uh, the trauma that they uh, witnessed and, and suffered serving our country in the war against terrorism. So um, we just have to keep mobilizing and uh, that's why we need to keep pushing uh, advocacy. And we have at the Kennedy Forum, parityregistry.org and we have paritytrack.org. What we need to do is strengthen our ability to monitor parity enforcement in each of the states. And we can only do that if people are willing to come forward with their own stories. I know stigma is great, but if we can just get more people to come forward, we'll have more of a chance to go to our state attorneys generals and our insurance commissioners in the 50 states and really impress upon them that this is uh, an issue that is a political issue, that these people are going to vote. They're going to it's not going to be good if, if state officials, Rep Republican and Democrat alike, are not doing everything they can during this mental health crisis of ensuring that their constituents get the care that they are entitled to under federal law. No, thank you, uh, Congressman Kennedy. There's certainly a, a lot of work to do to ensure that all the proposals being put forward by the administration, um, you know, become a reality, uh, particularly, um, you know, in Congress. Um, so speaking of, you know, uh, you know, change that's on the horizon, uh, many of us are very excited for the possibilities uh, to changing our country's uh, crisis response uh, system. So wanted to turn back to you, uh, Dr. Delphin Ripman. Um, and as many of us know, but also might be news to some people, there is uh, a new three-digit number, 988, 
uh, to reach the National Suicide Prevention and Behavioral Health Crisis Hotline that will become live on all phones nationwide in a little over two months. Um, and SAMHSA has really been leading the effort to ensure the system is ready and to begin to reimagine uh, behavioral health crisis response uh, nationwide. Um, and as we begin to build a system of comprehensive behavioral health uh, your crisis response, um, can you talk about how SAMHSA is working with other federal agencies to ensure funding and the coverage necessary to scale up this system? Yeah, absolutely. And and thank you for that. Uh, such an important question. And, you know, I do have to say we are so excited about this transformation because it means that when individuals are in crisis, they'll be able to dial this easy to remember three digit number, uh, speak with someone live, uh, potentially meet with a crisis worker who will meet them, uh, you know, where they are and ultimately connect them with services and support. So we're this is such an important uh, transformation really for the country in terms of uh, how we think about crisis care and, and, and suicide responsiveness. Um, and so, you know, uh, some of the work that we're doing, we know reimbursement is a, uh, an important uh, area here. And so we are working uh, with other federal partners uh, closely with, uh, for example, Department of Labor uh, related to the uh, intersection of parity and crisis services. Uh, also working very closely with CMS, uh, and they are fully committed to 988 and have been just wonderful partners. Uh, they, they've had uh, innovative efforts uh, in place, including in new waiver opportunities, uh, enhanced matching, uh, grant programs, uh, all in support of crisis services and systems. Um, and we've done convenings with states as well, uh, and co-convenings with SAMHSA and CMS. Uh, to work with states around uh, beginning to think about the crisis continuum um, and ways to fund services along the crisis continuum. Um, because we know ultimately the call center is one piece, but it's critical to think about funding along the full continuum of crisis services and supports. And so that's some of the work that's underway as well, uh, uh, you know, across federal partners. Um, and we know, of course, in, in terms of this area, there's a role for private sector as well. and and uh, so this is an area ultimately where multiple payers can play a role with funding the full crisis continuum uh, to ensure that people, uh, the services and supports are fully covered. So thank you. Thanks for that question. No, uh, thank you for all the work you're doing um, on getting the getting 988 ready and making sure that um, you know we're we're working to reimagine crisis response in this country. So we are nearing the end of our hour together. Um, so I'd like to conclude by asking each of our panelists, uh, you know, perhaps in a, a minute or so, um, you know, to really share a final thought about why they're hopeful for the future um, of parity, um, both for you know, enforcement of the Federal Parity Act, but also, you know, perhaps more broadly. Um, and so, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I'd love to you know, start with you about uh, you know, your, your thoughts for the future and what you're optimistic about. David, first, thank you for having us and to the Kennedy Forum for hosting this. Uh, why am I so hopeful? Well, uh, first, I have to say I'm, I'm the son of immigrants, so optimism runs in my DNA. Uh, I, I don't think any other way, but that things are going to get better. Glass is, only, glass is only half full. That's, that's what America's about, and that's what I believe it should be about. I also believe in the admonitions of Dr. King, who reminded us that progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Uh, it's not the product of luck or fate. It's, it comes because of hard work. And I believe that Americans who believe in mental health parity have finally, we've been able to shed these taboos, the, the stigmas, the denial, the deference, Today, we're all about strength and courage and accomplishment. And so folks are standing up and that's what you need if you wanna get things done. So the future of parity in America, it's on good ground. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. And we're so grateful for your joining us today and for your leadership, uh, really tremendous, uh, tremendous work. And next, uh, Dr. Delphin Ripman, uh, I'll turn to you. Yes, thank you. And, and so, you know, I, I also just want to thank Secretary Becerra, you know, Secretary, for your leadership, uh, for your voice on, on parity, uh, uh, for your commitment to behavioral health, 
uh, support of SAMHSA and, and other agencies across HHS, uh, you know, working on mental health and substance use er related areas. I also want to thank the Kennedy Forum for hosting us today for this such an important conversation. Um, you know, I want folks to know that there are resources, uh, parity resources available. Uh, the tools that I mentioned today, if people have questions about parity, if they have, uh, want additional information about how to advocate about, around what parity is, around what their rights are, uh, know that there are resources uh, and supports available. Uh, so certainly reach out to SAMHSA if, if you have questions there. Um, I'm optimistic that with the commitment that we're seeing across HHS that, that, that we'll make impacts here across HHS and with all of the panelists as well, that it is time to make an impact here in terms of uh, parity. And so uh, I just wanna thank everyone for their commitment and, and again, for this conversation as well. So thank you. No, th thank you, Madam Secretary, for all your, uh, all your leadership and important work. Um, Dr. Harris, uh, I'll turn to you next. Yes, and my thanks as well to Secretary Becerra and Assistant Secretary Delphine Rittman. Um, I am optimistic because for the first time in uh, my years of being a psychiatrist, there seems to be a confluence of voices in the private sector, in the public sector, in C-suites, um, across both sides of the aisle. There's bipartisan support, and for the first time, uh, in many years, uh, we have a president who talked about mental health in the State of the Union address. Uh, so I'm optimistic. I have to say I'm pragmatically optimistic because it will take work beyond words, uh, but I'm optimistic uh, that there are many voices that are elevating the issues around behavioral health. No. Well, thank, thank you, Dr. Harris. Completely agree with you. Um, uh, Sean? I'll, I'll agree with my panelists. I think the strong leadership from the administration, their their focus on parity, their commitment to enforcement, is a great uh, a great asset to have in this battle. Um, I agree with the secretary. We have seen a sea change. I think folks now recognize that there's kind of a silver lining out of COVID. It's that we all are facing increased anxiety, depression, loneliness exhaustion, you name it, that folks are realizing, hey, this can impact me as well. I think that is going to reduce um, a lot of the stigma around accessing behavioral health and SUD services. Um, I'm optimistic that the Senate Finance Committee and bipartisan members on both the House and Senate have indicated that they are very much committed to developing bipartisan proposals to move us forward in this parity process and improving access to mental health services. Um, and, you know, I, I just think I, I agree again that uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but I do think there is a lot of positive direction and a lot of good energy towards what I hope will be some significant policy improvements. Yeah, no, certainly there's a lot of action on the Hill, which is encouraging. Uh, Congressman Kennedy. Thank you, uh, David, for doing a great job at the Kennedy Forum and all your leadership and today. And uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you again so much for participating today and and for your personal commitment to the cause and, and, and stating that so eloquently. And, and Dr. Delphine Rittman, thanks for leading the charge. And with a particular eye that when we get the workforce, we ultimately need that that workforce is culturally competent and represents the communities that they will serve, which has traditionally not been the case in our mental health workforce. We have an existential crisis in our workforce in this country, not enough providers we need to right now um, remedy that and payers have an obligation. Um, they are part of the reason we do not have an adequate uh, workforce today, because as we've just heard, they've never paid mental health providers the same as they have their other providers. They have a special duty, a special moral obligation to stand up and help this country figure out the answer to this country's challenge of too few providers to meet the enormous demand and need of so many of our fellow Americans. So I would make a major call out to them. And the and the good news is I think this is not just in the country sister's interest. I think that this is in the payer's interest to step up because they're going to continue to face the consequences of being uh, delinquent on parity because of their inadequate in-network um, provider community. So they need to do this. And we would invite them to move quickly, not slowly. 
And uh, we, I thank all of those who are advocates out there because you're the ones who are going to define this as unacceptable any longer in this country to allow this double standard of care to be in place. And all of this will change as soon as people are standing up and saying it has to change. We would never tolerate this if it was for cancer, diabetes, any other physical issues, and we should no longer tolerate it because it's a mental health or addiction issue. And I am so charged when I go out there to see our fellow advocates in recovery and their families speaking up on this issue. And that gives me such great hope. And thank you, Dr. Harris, for your leadership and for being a child and adolescent psychiatrist. We do not have enough of you out there. We need to work with you and the American Medical Association, which you are president of, to get them to help us come up with these solutions. Because with their backing, we can make this not a healthcare, mental health care issue. We can make this a health care issue for all. Um, and I, I thank everyone for participating today. And I thank you, Sean, for your sponsorship and support. And look forward to uh, working with all of you to get this done. And, and today's announcement by you, Secretary Delphine Rimmon, was just terrific. And we'll work with you to see that those new resources are disseminated across the country amongst all of our fellow advocates. Great. Thank you.